side you have Rome and Ephesus, uh, sorry, Rome and Alexandria. On the other side, you have Antioch and Constantinople. And there was an excommunication for two years between the two sides. And then there was the formula of reunion drawn up by Theodora, sent by John of Antioch, yeah. and, signed and signed by Cyril in a Miaphysite interpretation. This is the key that for Cyril to accept the formula of reunion, you have to accept the Council of Ephesus and the 12 anathemas. The 12 anathemas are non negotiable, equal to the Creed of Nicaea. You can't get away from them. The way the Antiochians accepted uh, the formula of reunion was that the formula of reunion simply replaces the 12 anathemas and the Council of Ephesus, and we don't need to worry about them anymore. So even the reunion was done in a way that was not understanding of each other. And the evidence of this, you have uh, Ibas's letter, the letter of Ibas. Ibas was the bishop of Edessa. So he came from the same school, okay? Now, they, he said Cyril repented of his 12 anathemas. This is what Ibas says in his letter to the Church of the East, to modern, to modern Church, Church, of Church of the East. Church. He writes to him, he tells him, Cyril repented of his 12 anathemas. Okay, This letter, by the way, was accepted at the Council of Chalcedon. I'm going to say that a few more times mm. in the show. All right. Now, uh, 448... Let's fast forward a little bit. 448, there's a synod in Constantinople with a guy, a monk, a heretical monk, his name was Eurykes, who didn't know anything. As we say, he didn't know his head from his feet. He didn't know anything. And they asked him, they said, uh, is, God, is Jesus consubstantial with his father and consubstantial with his mother? He said, I don't know what consubstantial means. Uh, he said, whatever Athanasius said, I say it. I don't know what, what uh, consubstantial means. He should have kept his mouth shut. He shouldn't even talk, this guy. So, uh, And then they tried to impose on him to say, because they're from the same school, remember Constantinople, they're from the same school, say, say in two natures, Christ is in two natures, and I can't say that. This is not what my father's taught me. So yeah, I don't know a lot of things, but I can't say this. So then they excommunicate him. Who is his friend? The same emperor who was Nestorius's friend, Theodosius, still alive. He's like, oh, I don't want this guy to be excommunicated. The successor of Cyril in Alexandria, a handpicked successor, Saint Dioscoros of Alexandria, is now the Pope of Alexandria. So the, the, the Emperor Theodosius says, Come, Dioscoros, preside over another council in Ephesus so you can exonerate this guy, Eutyches. So in 449, Dioscoros presides over the council. He exonerates Eutyches because Eutyches gives an orthodox confession of faith. Now, the people who tried Eutyches for heresy, because Eutyches was found orthodox at the time, they have to be tried for heresy. Hmm. So they tried Flavian of Constantinople, the rest of them, Eusebius, whatever. They're tried, and you guys believe in two natures after the union, and uh, they don't answer. They don't give a defense for themselves. Dioscoros deposes, the, the Council of Ephesus too deposes them. By the way, called by the same emperor, Theodosius, who called the first Council of Ephesus. This emperor is canonized by all the churches, except for the church of Greece. Now, so he's he's deposed, uh, he's deposed, uh, Flavian is deposed. But who else is deposed? The entire Antiochian school of Theodore and Theodore and Nestorius and Theodore, the entire school is excommunicated. There's no more compromising, no more formula of reunion. Ibas is excommunicated, all that stuff. No more. We're not gonna, we're not gonna tolerate this kind of talk anymore. It's over. But what happens at the council? Leo, because he sent his legates, the Pope of Rome at the time, Leo, he sent his representatives to the council with a letter. The letter, they call it the Tome of Leo. Mm. It, in this letter, it is the judgment of Eutyches. But why would you read the judgment before the trial happens? That's what the council is for. The council is the trial. So why would you read the, the, the judgment if the trial didn't happen yet? So then after the, the judgment, after the guy gave an orthodox confession of faith, there was no more reason to read the Tome of Leo because the judgment is obsolete, right? Now, the Tome of Leo is diaphysical, and Leo learned from his teacher, Augustine, and there is connection between Augustine and Augustine. Now, 
So Leo's letter, like uh, Shamash Isaiah just said, Leo's, Leo is revered in the Church of the East for his diaphysitism. Now, with that counsel and having the ability to excommunicate Leo because it's an imperially called council and their decision was imperially recognized as law of the land, they still did not excommunicate Leo and they didn't condemn him. That mm. tells you something that they could have and they didn't. Now, Leo, though, is upset because they didn't read his letter. He excommunicated them all. <laughs> so now you have a big schism between the West and the East because Leo was mad they didn't read his letter. He excommunicated them. And then the, uh, the emperor dies. A new emperor comes in. He's like, Leo, I want to reconcile you. I want to reconcile Italy. What can I do? He's like, well, make the tome. It's not negotiable. Make it. Make everybody accept it. He's like, okay, I'm going to call a new council. You can, you guys can have your way, whatever you want to do in the council. The council happens. Leo obviously reverses in his mind, reverses everything that happened at Ephesus too. So Theodoret comes back. All these guys come back in into into their spots. Chalcedon happens. Dioscoros is deposed. Leo gets his way and everything. Now, Theodoret, we ask the other side. We tell them Theodoret was the friend of Nestorius. And he wrote against Cyril. Why did you guys accept him? They tell us he repented. Where is, where is his repentance? I want to see. They tell me the Acts of Chalcedon. Where he says, I have always been Orthodox and my teachers were Orthodox. That's his repentance? Is his repentance? <laughs> where is his repentance? So Theodoret, Theodoret Sam, he, he has a line. It's a very famous line. He says it in his writings against Cyril. Look what he says. He says, it is not the one who has life in himself who is killed. Rather, it is the one who possesses a mortal nature. Everyone hear that? It is not the one who has life in himself who is killed. Rather, it is the one who possesses a mortal nature. Now, I'm going to read, after reading this, I'm going to read what seems like a response to this, but actually... <laughs> The quotes I'm about to read were written over a hundred years before this. And it's as if they're responding to him by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Look, so the first one being from St. Afrahat, who is one of our Syriac saints. He says, the living one died instead of the dead. And through his death made our deadness come alive. This is St. Afrahat, second demonstration. So he's responding to Theodoret, who was much later. And then Ephraim, who I mentioned earlier, look what Ephraim says. Ephraim says, today there is born to you the life giver. The angel did not say there is born a man who will be a life giver or who will be a messiah, but rather today there is born to you the life giver. Savior. Who is not who is to become, but who is the Lord. Look and, to Lord. Yeah. and finally, and this is from the Church of the East. I'm going to read to you something from the Church of the East before the schism, because they are Khinwati. So Brothers. before the schism uh, in the in the Ninwe area, this was written. What is Nineveh today? So the capital of our people at the time. Uh, look at what they wrote. This is in the 4th century, okay? Ktawid Maschatha, the name of the source. Okay. Moreover, the word greatly excited creation. Who? The word. The word greatly excited creation. And it was turned around because they heard that the Son of God had died on account of sinners in order that they might repent and live. All the worlds were stirred. He who gives life to all died on account of his creatures. The Gentiles heard the care of God for them. And when people heard that a son of Adam died for his companions, it is one thing to hear that the son of Adam died for his companions, but another thing when they hear that the son of God died for his creation. Huh? Not the son of Adam, son of God died for his creation. Fine, yeah. 
Okay, and for his servants, it is not extraordinary that the sons of Adam die on account of their colleagues, since their nature is imperfect. But as the Lord, whose nature transcends death, died for the evil sons of Adam, hmm. human beings were captivated by this love because of this and loved him. But for the sake of the whole world which was lost, our Lord appeared physically so that he might win the whole world and so that the whole world might know the will of the God of God from God himself and from his footsteps. Therefore, his advent was for the sake of everyone so that everyone might learn of his lowliness, his kindness, and his gentleness so that people should not excuse themselves from this love and lowliness and patient suffering because they see that the Lord of all endured everything before them for the sake of everyone in view of all so that they marvel and say, if our Lord endured everything for our iniquity, how much more necessary it is for us to for us. Okay, so this is the Christology that we have. Ephesus has nothing to do with us having this Christology. Ephesus affirms the Christology that we had before it. The, the, the creed of the Synod of Antioch before Nicaea, we were saying, Yeldath Alaha, before before Ephesus, I'm saying before Nicaea, Ephesus is 431. Before Nicaea, before 325, in the creed of the Church of Antioch, we are saying Yaldat Allah. I mean, the birth of God, so they know what Yaldat Allah oh, means. The mother of God. The oh, mother of God. Yeah, Yaldat. The mother of God, we're saying it before Nicaea, we're saying it in our creed. Yeah. We're saying this about this single subject incarnate, one incarnate nature who dies on the cross for his creation. We're saying it before all of these councils. The council doesn't innovate. The council affirms. This is what it received. Anything innovates, we reject it. That's why we reject Chalcedon, because it's an innovation. So the councils of Ephesus 1 and 2 are Miophysite councils. And you have the Eastern Christians, we'll say Assyrian, Syriac speaking, Mm -hmm. All affirming composite nature. So the quotes you gave so people understand, what he was trying to show you, they didn't say the man Christ died, the son of Adam died. They say the Lord died. God died. He because contrasts it, Sam. He says it's one thing for a son of Adam to die. Yes. But it's another thing that the Lord of all, whose nature transcends death, dies for his creation. So God died. Now, obviously, he died a human death. But you understand what he's trying to show you, that the language of these Christians in the East, they didn't so distinguish the humanity of Christ from his divinity. They spoke of God dying, the Son of God dying, the Lord dying, not just merely.